everybody. We have some seats available, so please take your seats if you're still standing. Welcome. My name is Anita Salentic, and I'm the Head of Communications and Engagement at the Diocese of Parramatta, and I would like to start in the spirit of reconciliation and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands in which the Diocese of Parramatta sits, the land of the Darug and Gundagara people. We pay our respects to the Aboriginal elders past, present and future, for they hold the traditions, memories and wisdom of this country. Thank you for attending tonight's conversation with the esteemed Monsignor Thomas Hallick and Father Frank Brennan as part of the Bishop Vincent Presents series. Welcome to everyone on our live stream too. I'd firstly like to thank Bishop Vincent who is here tonight and in particular the very well connected Brother Mark O'Connor who is responsible for bringing Monsignor <laughs> Halleck to our shores. Thank you Brother Mark. Um, before we begin, just a few housekeeping matters. The bathrooms are located outside the hall on the second door and in, in the event of an emergency we will exit through the back doors and into the outdoor area. I'm sure you're all very excited to hear from Monsignor Halleck and Father Frank who will enlighten us on the topic help my unbelief, searching for God in a secular age. Their conversation will be followed by a Q&A and we will finish with a vote of thanks from Bishop Vincent. Now I know many of you would have done all of your reading on these two prominent figures, but for the uninitiated, Monsignor Thomas Hallick is many things. He's a theologian, a philosopher, psychotherapist, parish priest and best-selling author. He's known as the underground priest who was secretly ordained during the communist rule of Czechoslovakia. And since then, he has baptized over 3,000 young adults. He's well known to all three popes of our time and I can't wait to hear more of his story. We also have Father Frank Brennan who among many things has been named an Australian, Australian achiever and the National Trust has classified him as a living national treasure. <laughs> Such a treasure, Father Frank. Um, his advocacy in areas of law, refugee protection and Indigenous reconciliation has earned him many titles, including the meddling priest, well, according to former PM Paul Keating. So we have the underground priest and the meddling priest to help us in our search for God in a secular age. Welcome. Good evening everyone and great to be with you. I must say I prefer the title Kevin Rudd gave me when he launched my book entitled Acting on Conscience. He described me as an ethical burr in the nation's saddle. <laughs> um, I think that's a little more poetic than the other <laughs> But it's a great privilege to be here again with Thomas Hullick. Uh, we've had public conversations before, both face to face and on the ABC. Uh, but he's brought out yet another book, this time entitled The Afternoon of Christianity, The Courage to Change, and thus the opportunity to have further conversation this evening. What we're going to do in terms of process is shortly I'm going to invite Thomas to introduce himself to us for a few minutes. Then I'll engage in conversation, a Q&A with him for about 40 minutes. We've done a couple of these today, so as I explained to him, it will not be simply my crass Australian impoliteness when I cut him off from time to time, <laughs> because he is a very eloquent European <laughs> philosopher <laughs> and theologian, <laughs> and I've made it clear to him that an audience like this, there are a lot of things we want to cover, and many topics on which we would like to hear from him. And then we're going to allow plenty of time, 35 to 40 minutes, for questions from yourselves. So please be ready for those. We'll have roving microphones. Uh, the proceedings are being Zoomed, so you'll be going out to the world if you're prepared to get up and ask a question. And then at the conclusion, uh, we'll invite Bishop Vincent to come forward for a vote of thanks. So here we are with Thomas Harlick, as you've heard, uh, underground priest, psychotherapist, uh, one who has known the three most recent popes quite intimately. In 2014, he won the prestigious and lucrative Templeton Prize, which honours individuals whose exemplary achievements advance Sir John Templeton's philanthropic vision 
of harnessing the power of the sciences to explore the deepest questions of the universe and humankind's place and purpose within it. A couple of years later, he was awarded an honorary doctorate at Oxford University, and the citation noted, as physician, pastor, and writer, he gave thoughtful attention equally to his own flock and to those wandering outside it, and thus his ideas have spread far and wide. And from what little I've seen of the man thus far, I think this is the key to him, that he does give thoughtful, respectful attention equally to his own flock and to those wandering outside it. So, Tomas, you're very welcome here to the Diocese of Parramatta, and we'd like to start hearing a little more from you. Could you tell us who you are and how you got to be one who won the Templeton Prize and who is able to travel the globe uh, evangelizing on this modern theology? So, good afternoon. Uh, Frank, thank you for this nice obituary. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, uh, so, uh, quite uh, short, uh, I was born in 1948, so uh, deep in the last century. And uh, it was the year when the communists came to power in our uh, republic. And I grew up in the intellectual Prague family without any religious education. And my way uh, to uh, Christianity and the Catholic Church and to uh, priesthood was step by step. And the first step was the uh, attractiveness of the Christian and especially Catholic culture, uh, the spiritual music, the architecture, uh, and the literature also. Uh, the authors like Chesterton, Graham Greene, and others. And uh, uh, but um, and, it, and also uh, s this protest against the imposed atheism of the Marx-Leninist was also one of my, my, my motifs. Uh, but uh, then in uh, 68, in uh, the um, uh, period of so-called Prague Spring, I met uh, several priests and they spent 15, 16 years in prison. And, uh, uh, and uh, in that moment, the church uh, has for me uh, the human faces. It was uh, not just uh, the culture, uh, but also uh, there were the witnesses, the human faces. And uh, I, uh, I, I, it was the time in 68, uh, it was the spring of my life, I was 20. It was the spring of the church uh, immediately after the Second uh, Vatican Council. And uh, the spring of the hope of some liberalization of the regime in 68. But then came the Russian tanks, the occupation, and another 20 years of persecution. The first 20 years of persecution, especially in the 50s, was very harsh. I think the Stalinists have chosen the Czechoslovakia as the field of experiment of total atheization of the society from various reasons, also because of this complicated religious history of our country and whose uh, who side wars and the violent Catholicization in the 17th century and so on. So we were uh, relatively secularized country also uh, between the wars. And uh, then came this hard secularization, the persecution in the 50s. And after uh, this uh, small period uh, about the Prague Spring, it was another 20 years of persecution, which was not so drastic as in 50s, but more sophisticated. So the secret police was everywhere and, and so. And, um, I, uh, my, uh, my, uh, my war with, with the communism began um, on, uh, my, uh, on the ceremony when I received a doctor degree at the Charles University. Uh, there was the uh, ceremony and um, uh, one student or one doctor uh, should have the speech thanks to the Communist Party and the regime and so. And I put this paper in my pocket and I um, uh, got a spontaneous speech 
about the importance of truth, and I thanks to our professors, they are no more at our faculty because they will uh, push out. Uh, and uh, so it was the beginning and the end of my academic career for 20, for 20 years. I was not allowed to teach at the university. I was uh, a many psychotherapeut with drug abusers and alcoholics. And uh, at the same time, I uh, decided to uh, be a priest. Uh, perhaps uh, one decisive moment uh, was uh, the self-offering of my fellow student, Jan Palach, who burned himself as a protest against uh, the occupation and against the beginning of uh, this uh, tiredness of the society. It was the beginning of some um, compromises with the, with, the, uh, with the regime. And I organized uh, the Requiem for Jan Palach in one uh, church of Prague, and I brought the death mask of Jan Palach there. And it was uh, in the night, uh, snowing, uh, I went through the Charles Bridge with the death mask. And it was for me uh, the uh, occasion for some inner dialogue with this Jan Palach. And I realized he offered his life, and I must also do something with my life. I, can, uh, I can't uh, live from one day to another. So I think it was the beginning of my vocation, but uh, there was only one priest seminary in our country, absolutely controlled by the state, so, uh, and uh, um, it was only possibility to enter the seminary m immediately after the secondary school, and I put already my, my doctorate in philosophy and sociology, so it was the only way to study uh, in secret. Uh, some of the Western theologians came to our country as private tourists, giving us the lectures in the, in the, in the private flats and brought us some books and so on. So some people uh, from this underground church were not so isolated from uh, the um, uh, development of, of, of theology because it was, uh, and I'm sure they <laughs> and, uh, 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 because you know, uh, the, the Vatican II uh, was in time when um, there was a communist regime, so our priests have no possibility to study the modern uh, theology. And without knowing this intellectual background of the Vatican II, they were not able to understand it. So uh, it was accepted uh, formally, so we turned the altar and we changed the language uh, from Latin to national language, but without changing the mentality. And the importance is the mentality, and now, uh, with the Pope Francis, we should change our mentality again and to make another step in this direction from Catholicism to Catholicity. But perhaps we will speak so about you, it. You became a, a priest. Yeah. And then, as a priest in this very atheistic society uh, where the state was still very strong, you introduced over 3,000 young people to the church and baptized them. What's the secret? How did you do that? <laughs> Ask the Holy Ghost. <laughs> he was helping me without his power. Uh, I was nothing. But um, uh, yeah, I was 11 years in underground. So in this underground, I was not so missionary. I've got, uh, I converted some people, yes. Uh, but I, um, I was mainly uh, supporting in the late 80s our Cardinal Tomasek, uh, who was the only bishop in office. And he was very cautious. Uh, but uh, in the late 70s, and especially with the new pope, John Paul II, he became more uh, strong and he became uh, the national hero and the symbol of, uh, uh, of the struggle for religious freedom and human rights. And he accepted three priests from the underground church, and I was one of them, uh, to support him. He was almost uh, 90, so I prepared uh, his uh, sermons and, and open letters to the government. And it was the communist time. And after the fall of communism, I, uh, I founded uh, the 
academic parish in Prague and uh, the Czech Christian Academy and uh, I started to teach at the university and in this 32 years of my ag pastoral activity in this academic parish I baptized more than uh, 3,000 adults also some, some, some children one of the child I baptized is here now. <laughs> uh, here? Yeah, please. <laughs> He was like this, ne? <laughs> he's now like this. Uh, but uh, uh, mainly there were the adult people, and we have two years catechumenate. Uh, every week uh, lecture and discussion, and then also some common weekends. Because I recognize it is very important to have the uh, space for a common meditation and discussion, because uh, just the, the, the lecture it's not enough. It's, uh, it is important to give uh, the catechumens intellectual background, insight, and, and to go deeper and so. But after this, when I baptize many in this, uh, in this uh, first years, I realize that when they return from Prague after uh, finishing the study uh, to their native small um, uh, towns, uh, then, they, uh, then they went to the church, and in the church there were five uh, old ladies and one pastor who has the same preaching uh, ten years. <laughs> and so uh, they told me, it is the church you, in, uh, you, you introduce us, and no, thank you. <laughs> And, and and then uh, and they wanted to help the priest and said, I would like to help. No, 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 I'm doing uh, everything myself. Ne? And you're, you're from Prague, uh, from Harik. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so, uh, but then uh, we uh, found it a spiritual center. Uh, when people are coming for them courses in, in, in contemplative prayer, meditation, and spiritual uh, retreats, and sometimes the spiritual retreats are creative with the modern art, with the films, for example. The people are one week in absolute silence, and they see twice a day very strong film with the impulses. I don't mention the actors, but the message on the film, how it's connected with your life and with your emotions. And then is the possibility to speak with one priest and one um, lady uh, psychotherapeut about uh, these emotions, about this. And I think such a way uh, is important to open the space for these seekers and to accept them as they are. I always say, uh, be as you are. Frankly, you have the right to, to have your doubts, to have your questions. I have no answers. I have uh, not all answers for all questions. I would like to, uh, to, to, to teach you to enter the cloud of mystery and to live with the mystery and uh, not uh, to give you uh, ideology and, uh, and the answers for all questions. And we must always, uh, God is uh, the great uh, mystery and there is always, yes, there is the revelation, the revelation in the Bible, the revelation in the tradition, but all our life is the revelation of God. And we should uh, f seek God in everything and to discover him. And I think uh, this is the adventure to, uh, to, 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 to find God in many things and many new forms. So out of that pastoral experience, you then took to writing books with some captivating titles. Last time we had a public conversation here in Australia, you'd published Patience with God, yeah. and then The Night of the Confessor, Christian Faith in an Age of Uncertainty, and now you're publishing The Afternoon of Christianity, The Courage to Change. Why The Afternoon of Christianity, and give us a sense of this courage 
that is needed and for what change. Okay, uh, so I use the metaphor which uh, Carl Gustav, uh, Gustav Jung, the founder of the depth psychology, used uh, to describe the human life. He said uh, the childhood and uh, youth is like morning of life, and then uh, then uh, comes uh, the midday crisis or midlife crisis, <laughs> the shattering of uh, some certainties, and after that is is the afternoon as the uh, time for maturity, for uh, um, uh, for finding the deeper dimension of life and so on. We can use the afternoon of life uh, just to continuing the task for the morning, not just to develop our career and, and, and property, uh, but um, it is a time uh, to look for some new values. And I apply this metaphor for the history of Christianity. The pre-modern time is like the morning time for uh, creating the structures, institutional structures of the church, the doctrinal structures of the church, and then came the modernity and secularization as the time of shattering of uh, this crisis. And I think part of this crisis is also this uh, uh, abuse uh, crisis, this shattering of the credibility of church, and uh, I think the Pope Francis discovered very uh, courageously that it is not problem of some individuals, it's a problem of the system of the church. There's something wrong in the whole system and there must be some change of the system of clericalism uh, and so on. So I think we are on the threshold on uh, this afternoon of Christianity, uh, which is the opportunity. It is not, uh, this development is not uh, the automatic progress. Uh, there are always uh, some possibilities, and the method I developed, I call it chirology, to recognize kairos, the time as a time of opportunity. And uh, I think uh, now is one of these moments in history, uh, the opportunity for change, for deepening the faith, uh, and the broaden uh, the concept of church, and the deepening the concept of faith and Christianity. So uh, uh, the afternoon of Christianity is time for the deeper Christianity, more ecumenical, for the reform of the church, to make the church broader, to, uh, to, to trans, uh, uh, for the transformation and trans transgression of these limits, the institutional limits, the limits of our mentality, to open our mind and heart for and this spirit who is always working in our hearts, in the church, but also outside of the church, in the world. And something that comes through very strongly, I think, in your new book with this idea of chirology is that Christians often make the mistake. It's as if we're just going step after step through death yeah, and then yeah. to resurrection. But you are adamant that death and resurrection are yeah. always in the mix together and that we find the spirit at work in the midst of tension and paradox. And it seems to me that uh, you're not so at home with those who are rabid atheists or with those who are just absolutely convinced Christians. You're most at home, it seems, with those who are wrestling with the doubts and uncertainties, trying to hold together the tradition with a realistic response to the spirit of the age. Could you comment on that? Uh, yes. Uh, I think there's a spectrum of uh, the um, spiritual life uh, uh, contemporary is very colorful. Um, uh, the number of people, they are fully identified with the organized religion uh, is diminishing. Um, uh, but I think it's also the number of the dogmatic atheists is diminishing, and uh, what is in uh, what is in, in 
Greece, it's, it's, the, it's the number of the seekers. They are a little bit between. They, uh, uh, also among those, they say we are believers, are not only the uh, dogmatic believers, but the people for them, the faith is the way, uh, is the journey. And uh, uh, also, for some people, they say, I am atheist, I don't believe. Uh, they are, sometimes I ask those people, oh, how the God uh, looks like in which you don't believe? <laughs> and if he, uh, tell me this uh, concept of God, and thanks to God that you don't believe in such a God. In such a God, I don't believe either. Uh, many of the atheists, atheists are not against God, but against theism, against, uh, against the human concept of God, uh, uh, which is always limited and uh, sometimes also destructive. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, s we should uh, offer them uh, a new vision of God, new way to seek God. Uh, so I think there are many people today, they are uh, simul fideris et infideris. In the same time, they are believers and non-believers, but uh, the, the dialogue between belief and unbelief is not a dialogue between two limited uh, group of people, but it is something what happened in the uh, single human heart and, 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 and mind, that this dialogue between belief and doubt, it could be also very healthy and useful, um, because I think the uh, face without the critical thinking and without some honest doubts could be fundamentalism, fanaticism, uh, bigotry. Uh, we need also this open question. We need some doubts. It's not doubts about God. It is doubts about our concept of God. And, uh, um, and uh, also the, the rationalism uh, without the spiritual dimension, uh, it's also one-sided. Uh, so um, I think we need this dialogue, which is now, not, uh, so many walls have uh, fallen in our world. Not only the wall, uh, the Berlin Wall, but also the wall between the believers and the atheists. Uh, I think um, uh, there is the meeting, there is the mixture, which could be also some syncretism, but I think it is not only possibly the syncretism, it's also some, some, some um, uh, dynamic um, um, relation and some inner dialogue. And so, and I think we should cultivate this dialogue and, and, and support the, 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 the courage uh, to, to seek our own way. So let's talk a little about the church and popes and how the church is an institution and popes might help us believe or not believe. Um, you're a European intellectual, uh, a charming man who's had, it would seem, a very good relationship with the last three popes. And last time you were here in Australia, you were speaking beautifully about all that John Paul II and Benedict had contributed. And this time you've told us much about what Francis has done and your own relationship with each of them. In the conflicted church as it is at the moment, a lot of people would wonder how you could still espouse John Paul II the Great while being a great fan of Pope Francis. Mm -hmm. So could you give us some sense of yep. your relationship with each of them and how you see each of them okay. as contributing to yeah. this mission of the church? It's not just the fidelity to the papacy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the understanding that each of, of, of these popes was the right person for, uh, for, for, for the right moment. And uh, the situation in the 80s uh, and 90s was quite different. The sign of the times were quite different than, uh, than our time. So uh, John Paul II wouldn't be good pope for uh, this moment, but he was a very good pope for, uh, for, uh, for, for, for the 80s, and he played also a great political role. Uh, so uh, his first 
first visit to uh, native land, to Poland, created an atmosphere in which uh, the, uh, the movement Solidarność was born, because um, it was so great manifestation of the, uh, of the moral power of the church that even the communists realized, oh, uh, we have not the power. Uh, the, the most important man is the Polish Pope for the Polish nation, but not only for the Polish nation, it was also for the whole uh, whole era in the communist. So uh, we were so very happy that it's a Pope who knew uh, what is communism, and he uh, and 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 uh, and uh, uh, so uh, he was important for this uh, overcoming the communism for the unification of Europe and so on. Uh, I met him, uh, so f f it's a long story, i make it very short. <laughs> um, uh, I was uh, secretly ordained in the private chapel of a bishop in Germany, in East Germany, just day before the intronization of John Paul II. And I thought myself, would I have one day the opportunity to say to this Pope, I am the first priest ordained under your pontificate. <laughs> and uh, I've got this uh, opportunity 11 years after. Um, it was the time, it was 89, when it uh, was in Rome uh, the canonization of Agnes of Prague, and we were allowed uh, first time to go to Rome, 11,000 pilgrims, and uh, I use this uh, uh, this uh, possibility uh, to, uh, to 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 meet the Pope personally. It will be another uh, great story. But uh, I went there. I was invited for a private dinner with uh, one Czech exile bishop uh, to Pope. It was the day before the fall of Berlin Wall, and the Pope came from the TV and said, this is the end of communism. <laughs> and I said, Holy Father, excuse me, I don't believe that the paper infallibility does work also in the political <laughs> affairs. I think there will be some five years of perestroika. No, no, it, you must be prepared. It will be very soon. It was in ten days, you know, in ten days, and and uh, I did at home, and there was a velvet revolution, uh, and then uh, the uh, the bishop, uh, the Czech exile bishop, came for Christmas uh, to Prague after forty years, and I introduced him to my good friend Václav Havel. We were very good friends for forty years. It was two days before his election president, and he said, perhaps uh, if I would be uh, elected president, I would like to invite the Pope to uh, Czechoslovakia, and perhaps before the first free election, who can influence the moral atmosphere and so. And uh, uh, bishops are all those, it's, it's, it's a two years preparation of the mm, papal visit and so. Uh, but when uh, he uh, returned to Rome, he was invited to Pope for, for, for dinner, and he uh, told him about uh, our uh, meeting with Václav Havel, and the Pope said, why not, why not, <laughs> but I must have the invitation. So, um, and the bishop called me at night and said, you must go uh, to Václav Havel, he was already president, and he was, I think, the second day in office, and I came there, Václav, we must write the invitation, we yeah. did it, and then I was invited to prepare this uh, visit in Rome, so I spent one month, more than one month, with the Pope practically every day uh, preparing this, 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 this visit. And it was also the um, occasion I met first uh, personally um, uh, Karna Ratzinger, and I invited him to give a lecture on the Christian Academy, and he told me, oh, uh, I was so 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 near uh, to to uh, I was in Regensburg and I never been in Prague and I I answered um, Eminence it's not a sin, but a shame. <laughs> 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 it's not the Sünde, aber Schande. And uh, 
I said, yes, yes, you are right. And, and, and he came and, 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 and I, 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 I um, accompanied him through, through Prague and then, and then he came again as Pope. And um, uh, so uh, I got quite a good, uh, and when I met him uh, in Rome, always he asked how it is with theological faculty and how theology and so, so I got also with him. I think he was the good man that John Paul II and the Benedict were the two popes, they ended honestly uh, one period of the church history. It was a period where the main task was the confrontation or, or some uh, with, with the modernity. And I think the, uh, the good uh, uh, goal or the, or, or the result of this confrontation was the famous discussion uh, of uh, Ratzinger with Jinger Habermas, and, and they both uh, united that the Christianity, the Christian theology, and the secular humanism need each other to complement and to overcome uh, uh, the one-sidedness of both sides. So the, the dialogue uh, with the sec and I think it was the good. Uh, for, for the time, and he has also this idea about the courtyard for the Gentiles. Ne? He expressed this idea first time when he was in the plane to Prague. I think his best, uh, his best ideas was always in the plane. Uh, he was perhaps <laughs> very, <coughs> very, very near to the boss, so, uh, and it was the idea that the church shouldn't be just uh, the ghetto, just a sect. Uh, only the sect has the, only the people that are fully identified. Now the church is not a sect. The church must have uh, the open space also for the seekers, for the people they are not fully identified. As this uh, uh, temple in Jerusalem had this, uh, this, this space for this uh, pious pe uh, pagans. Ne? And I think it was quite a good idea to, to, to invite those people uh, and uh, to have the dialogue with uh, the agnostics. Uh, but uh, it was v very good for, for, for his time. But now, is the radical change, so the modernity is over, and uh, I think this temple uh, character of the church is also so destroyed, and that uh, we must go, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the Pope Francis, uh, day before his election, that uh, Jesus is knocked on the door, but he is knocked, uh, this time he is knocked from inside, he won't go outside. He won't go outside of the, of, of the church and we must follow him. He goes to the marginalized and so on and so on. So I think it is the new task, it is a new uh, period and he is the right so, uh, man so for this period. So in terms of going out to those groups and particularly the seekers, I'm thinking, those who have an enhanced sense of morality about the environment or questions about sexuality or the place of women or the entitlements of First Nations peoples where yeah. they think the church is just not up to grade. Yeah. How do we take the spirit of what is required there, uh, particularly with the synod process that's now underway, and how do we wrestle with that tension between dogma and authority and pastoral engagement, solicitude, and really engaging with the signs of the times. Just to quote one sentence from the Synod document of last mm -hmm. October. If we use doctrine harshly and with a judgmental attitude, we betray the gospel. If we practice mercy on the cheap, we do not convey God's love. The unity of truth and love implies bearing the difficulties of others, even making them our own, as happens between brothers and sisters. How do we do that, mm -hmm. particularly through this synod process? I think this method of, uh, the, uh, of the synodal uh, uh, reform uh, is very good. I, I, I took part in this uh, uh, continental synod and uh, there was this method which was on uh, each level uh, uh, to put uh, people together 
and then to um, put a question and the time for answering. Everybody should uh, uh, freely um, express his own opinion. And then was the time for reflection, time for, for, uh, for silence, for meditation, for prayer. And then uh, each participant should say what was important for him uh, on uh, what, what the other people uh, said. N not just repeat my own uh, vision, but to say that I, I was listening what uh, my neighbor was uh, saying, and I think it was uh, important also for me. And then another time for silence, and then uh, the summary of this. And I think it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful method. I use it sometimes with my students. I think it would be also good for parliament eh? <laughs> to, <laughs> to have these moments of, of, <laughs> of, 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 of uh, contemplation. And so I think the politics, politics would be uh, quite different if there will be this contemplative approach to reality. And uh, I think that uh, synodality is not only the medicine for the church, but also for the world. And, um, uh, it's, uh, it should be also the culture of ecumenism of uh, many different levels. Uh, so how, how would you apply that, like in the parish I'm in the last couple of weeks, I've had parishioners say to me regarding Pope Francis talking about uh, the blessings for same-sex couples. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying, well, if there can be a blessing, why can't there be for a formal ritual? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, why can't it be something more mm -hmm, like mm -hmm, the sacrament of marriage? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you have parishioners saying, yeah. what about what's in the catechism yeah, or yeah. what is our traditional mm -hmm. teaching about marriage? What is going on here? Mm -hmm. what, what do you do with those yeah. groups of parishioners? So, uh, this is a challenge from the intra-Catholic ecumenism, which is much more difficult than the inter-religious <laughs> <laughs> relations. Sometimes I, I, I have the better uh, communication with Muslims and, and, and Jews um, than with, with, with some Catholics. <laughs> And uh, uh, yes, uh, there's uh, various level of, 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 of a dialogue, and the intra-Catholic dialogue <laughs> is the most difficult. <laughs> and uh, but um, yes, uh, there's the only way to to to, uh, to create the atmosphere of openness, of mutual respect, and 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 to understand, uh, to start with what we have in common and then why uh, we have the things uh, but uh, why we uh, look at this uh, uh, this topic from so differently uh, maybe it is because we have the different perspective uh, for me it was a formative uh, a formative life experience when I was 20 I was invited it was just in the time uh, about this Prague Spring, I was invited to take part in uh, the seminar which was organized by the British Quakers in Austria. And there were the people uh, from uh, many countries, continents, political, religious groups, and we discussed three weeks together all day um, about uh, the great uh, uh, topics like the peace and war and the social justice. We didn't solve all problems of the world. But I learned to see the thing from the perspective of the others. There were some, some left-wing uh, theologian of liberation from South uh, America, and so we were anti-communists, and so, so it's possible. And then I realized, oh, when I would, uh, uh, when I would uh, live in the South uh, America uh, with this experience, perhaps I will see, uh, I would see uh, the world from another perspective. And uh, so I must uh, always a little bit to uh, in the shoes of, <laughs> of, of the others, ne? to 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 look uh, from the uh, perspective of the other and dialogue 
is the way how to broaden my own perspective because everybody has the limited perspective. Only uh, nobody is in God-like position. Only God can see everything. We all uh, see the thing limited, and we we we, we need a respect to other people to try to, to ask the question perhaps ne? and also these conflicts it, is, uh, it helps me also the 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 uh, Zege Jung ne? that sometimes it is the projection of our own own shadow ne? we have our own shadow side of our personality something what we are not uh, able and not willing to accept on ourselves so we project this on the others and then we can beat it ne? and uh, it's good if uh, you have somebody who uh, is very unsympathetic to you to ask if he is not a mirror uh, he uh, reflected your own shadow side ne? so sometimes we should uh, ask, oh, why, uh, why uh, these uh, people so, so, so provoke me? Eh? And because maybe they show me my own shadow, uh, the, um, the part of my life and my personality which I'm not able to accept. And so this is also some key, so some dialogue, eh? but what it is said. Uh, Difficult task. Now, one last question from me before I hand over to the audience. Uh, in uh, your latest book, The Afternoon of Christianity, you tell a Czech legend. You say, the builder of one of the Gothic churches in Prague ordered the wooden scaffolding to be set alight after the construction was finished. When the fire ignited and the scaffolding tumbled thunderstruck Street to the ground, the builder panicked and committed suicide thinking that his building had collapsed. How then did you apply that legend to church structures, mm -hmm. particularly parishes? <laughs> because I think many people uh, think that the church is now collapsing, and perhaps it's collapsing just this uh, wooden uh, construction. And um, they must have the courage to go through this uh, through this crisis, uh, and uh, yes, some, some people think that uh, the uh, Pope Francis is like the Gorbachev of Catholicism, <laughs> that um, his, uh, uh, his call for openness uh, and, and for, for, for uh, to, be, to be frankly, it's something like the, uh, like the glasnost of, uh, of, of, of Gorbachev, ne? to speak openly what you think. And, uh, and this uh, uh, synodal process is like the perestroika. And they say, look what was with the Soviet Union after this uh, reform of Gorbachev. But those people think that the Catholic Church is the totalitarian system. And they want to have the church as a totalitarian system. And uh, they are partly right. So there are some structures in the Catholic Church vi uh, which are totalitarian. And they are now in danger uh, during this process. of. Uh, so, uh, but uh, I believe and I hope that the majority of uh, Catholics believe that uh, our uh, church is not a totalitarian system and we uh, we don't need to uh, be afraid of some uh, reform. So many people are in the church not because of the uh, gospel, but because they won't be the part of the institution uh, which is uh, um, uh, which is uh, the same forever, ne? which is unchangeable. Uh, but uh, it is an illusion. Everything uh, living is uh, changeable. And uh, uh, so there were so many, uh, so many reforms in the history of the church. And this is one of them. And we must go through. Mm. I love your description of the conversation between Sigmund Freud and Oscar Pfister, mm -hmm. where Freud was wondering if a Christian could be tolerant of atheism. And Pfister said, when I reflect that you are much better and deeper than your disbelief, and that I am much worse and more superficial than my faith, I conclude that the abyss between us cannot yawn so grimly. <laughs> so there is hope. 
So please, over to you. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, please stand up, wait till the microphone is presented, introduce yourself, and ask a crisp question. And slowly and distinctly. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. Oh, one and then two. Yep. Now I should warn you, Thomas, that the first questioner has read your new book in German. Ah, uh -huh. uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of books in German. Professor Halik, uh, thank you very much. And, and uh, in your book, The Afternoon of Christianity, uh, you argue that the future of the church uh, essentially rests on dialogue with the, with the nuns, those who say no religion on the census form, the spiritual seekers among them. And further, you talk about a kenosis of the church today, and this kenotic church will find Christ in Galilee. But the Christ that it will find in Galilee will be these nuns, will be the spiritual seekers. Yeah. I wonder if you'd like to comment on that or develop that theme. Thank you very much. So I like this scene from the Gospel, the women by the open, empty tomb. And there is the voice uh, from heaven, um, go to Galilee and you will uh, find him. And I think we should find, we should seek and find the Galilee of today. And I think the Galilee of today is this word of these nuns. And, and there is uh, the transformed uh, risen Christ, because um, I believe in the continuing resurrection. And uh, resurrectio continua. Uh, the resurrection is not just a moment of uh, reanimation of the dead body, but uh, uh, it is a transformation even the dearest and nearest of Jesus were not able to recognize him after the resurrection and for Mary Magdalene he was gardener and so on and I think uh, he's coming to us today in many transformed um, uh, figure and uh, uh, and the Christian uh, existence is the adventure to uh, discover uh, Jesus in his anonymity, in the new forms, among these so-called non-believers, among the foreigners, uh, uh, among the others. And uh, I think it's our task to recognize him. Sometimes we can recognize him um, uh, along the wounds. Eh? I like this uh, legend that was St. Martin, that the St. Martin and the devil appeared in the figure of Christ. And the Martin asked, where are your wounds? So I don't believe in Christ without wounds. I don't believe in church without wounds. I don't believe in faith without wounds. So the wounds, uh, Jesus came and he legitimated himself through his wounds. And I think if we ignore the wounds of Christ in our world, uh, we have no right to say, uh, like Thomas, my Lord and my God. The only uh, sentence in the Gospels when uh, Jesus is called God is this situation that Thomas is touching the wound of Christ. He sees uh, the God through the wounds of the resurrected Christ. And I think we should uh, to touch the wounds uh, of, of the world and to, to see God through the wounds. Yes. I'm a deacon of the Paramatta Diocese and a retired medical doctor. The many of the states in Australia have legalized euthanasia, voluntary assisted dying. Now, for professionals who are faithful Catholics, they feel forced into becoming nothing more than a uh, anti-abortion, anti-euthanasia lobby group, which is very narrow. Now, how then, in the spirit of synodality, can our 
Catholic professionals engage in a conversation about the good news in the face of death. Mm -hmm. Hard question. Um, I'm afraid about euthanasia because I think it could be misused. Um, uh, in our society uh, is the, um, um, is the high uh, age uh, and the old people are not so uh, accepted as in the uh, as in the Asia and is uh, and as in uh, in the previous uh, previous time the, uh, when I was in in Japan so uh, the uh, old people are so um, respected and uh, in our society uh, the uh, old people are not the source of wisdom like before because the youth uh, uh, have these uh, techniques and, and, and I think we are more clever than our grandfather uh, he don't understand nothing uh, the, the, the world is so changed and, and so uh, sometimes the old people are uh, it's, 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 they are the troublemakers, ne? and and if uh, uh, um, and it could be a little bit like it was uh, uh, at the beginning with abortion. Ne? They say it is just for the situation uh, when uh, the. Uh, uh, when the mother is in danger, and and then it became something obvious, n and and the young ladies came for the abortion, like uh, to to the tooth, uh, to the dentist, n and uh, I'm afraid, and that's uh, in uh, I don't know if it is in uh, also in English, but in our um, they they have that uh, the. Přerušení uh, života. The the uh, in, in uh, uh, a car of, 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 of life, ne? but it is not car, it is the end of life. Ne? And uh, uh, so I, I, I'm afraid that uh, sometimes uh, the young generation could, uh, uh, could uh, breed the, the old people uh, for, for some sort of mild liquidation. Ne? because um, they are just um, troublemakers. And I'm afraid of this, so I think uh, I can understand that in some um, difficult cases we can a uh, little bit help uh, the people. Uh, but, you know, um, also the medicine is now in progress, so we can perhaps uh, a little bit uh, um, to help this uh, um, this sorrow and 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 this uh, pains and so on. I don't know. I'm I'm afraid about the euthanasia. That, that something which could be misused. Maybe I'm wrong, but uh, this is now my position. And also the abortion. Abortion is evil, but uh, uh, but the criminalization of abortion it is another thing. Eh? And and uh, we cannot. Uh, uh, yes, uh, there was uh, in Poland there was very strict criminalization of abortion, but the result was the abortion touristic. Uh, the the Polish ladies came to 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 Czech Republic for the abortion industry. So I think <coughs> that the, uh, the the resolution is not is not in the law in the criminalization of abortion, but in the creating the the conditions for the uh, single mothers and 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 and, and so on eh, to to help uh, to help uh, the women's uh, to keep the life of the child but um, it is the way and the education and then the social help uh, it is a better way than just the criminalization so once again, I've followed the star from the east to the Diocese of Parramatta, the Enlightened Diocese, and I have a question. What's your realistic hopes for the Synod on Synodality? Hmm. Ask the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I don't know. So I I I I, I hope that that this will be not the end of the process. Because for, for many priests in our country, that's, oh yes, this is a campaign. Eh? This is a campaign, and we, we've got some, uh, something from, from, from the diocese, and uh, we must uh, fulfill this paper, and it will be, uh, perhaps, will come something from Rome. But it is not a synodality. The synodality is to uh, to happen something from grassroots and 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 to to, to start with. Uh, so uh, uh, the synodality is not just uh, the one congress in Rome, but it's the start of the new way how to be church, and and uh, and it is the process for for uh, to eschatological goal of the church. So uh, I hope there will be some changes. Uh, but um, I don't think it will be so radical in the in the this year. Uh, but maybe it will, and perhaps I hope there will be some decision that uh, there must be the multi-speed uh, reform in the church. You know? uh, uh, it, it was visible in this um, uh, affairs of the family. So the family in Africa is something quite different than the family in France. N and uh, it, is, uh, it is difficult to give some one, uh, one solution uh, for the family life and also about the homosexuality and so it was now visible ne, the the the, the, the uh, African uh, Church uh, and and protest against this uh, blessing, uh, so it must be some multi-speed um, uh, multi-speed uh, reform uh, because for something is the Church in West uh, more prepared than the Church in in in. I don't know, in Asia, in Africa, and so on. So we must have uh, a little bit of the recognition and uh, uh, tolerance uh, for each other. Yes. Um, thank you. I feel nervous to ask this question. <laughs> My name's Balana. I'm one of the founding members of the Safeguarding Council which came out of the Institute of Child Abuse, uh, the Royal Commission that happened. And I'm thankful through the leadership of Bishop Vincent that we've been able to create a system that is healing. And you talked about the wounds of the church. You also talked about how um, the spirit of the church needs to look at the opportunities and to look at the systems in itself. And so we've been able to do that through the Safeguarding Council and present it to the Vatican. My question to you, in the spirit of healing, the topic is help my unbelief. What message would you give to those victims or those that have been hurt by people in the church about God to say, keep believing? What would you say to them? That's my question. Uh, uh, the, the last sentence. Please. So those that have been hurt yeah. by situations in the church yeah. that have that have put them into a journey of unbelieving, what would you encourage them to help them to believe again? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we uh, should reflect about the image, uh, image of God and the concept of God. So there are some too narrow concept of God. And uh, we should teach the people to discover uh, the God in everything, the God who is present in everything. And uh, I think this is perhaps the way. Yeah. Your concept of chirology, what is the kerygma for this kairos? What is the, if a young secular seeker comes to you, what is the good news you say that the church offers? Uh, it is very personal. So there is no 
universal answer because everybody has his own way, his own uh, way of seeking and uh, and I must first of all to recognize what is the most important for him. So the Luther said that God is what is the most important for, for, for a person. So um, I think it's uh, important to have the dialogue uh, about the the personal values and and wha what what is the important for you and what is God for you <laughs> and <coughs> and um, I think this is the start of 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 a, uh, of a dialogue so uh, and um, and also this contemplative approach uh, to the reality because uh, in our society we are so quickly. Um, uh, we have so 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 quick answer. So the 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 artificial intelligence will change our society and our civilization uh, very radically, even more than the industrial revolution. And I'm a little bit afraid that uh, uh, the artificial intelligence have very quick answers. So we, uh, immediately answers what what the uh, artificial intelligence is not able to do is the prayer <laughs> and contemplation and a uh, little bit to, to reflect. Ne? It was in this process uh, of, of synodality, this moment of reflection and to see the things from the other, uh, from the other side. And I think this is what we should, uh, it is the human and uh, I think it is also our uh, our 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 task. Uh, always is this contemplative approach to go a little bit deeper and to see uh, the things from a little bit from the God's perspective. We are not in the godlike position, but we can uh, look at the I think a little bit from the higher. Uh, from the higher perspective. I think contemplation is a chance to see the things uh, from the broader uh, perspective. And it is the uh, Jesuit uh, uh, method of uh, the examen, <laughs> to, 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 to uh, reflect uh, my reaction, uh, what I have d today, uh, I met some people, I read a book and so, uh, what remains is me. Uh, what is my 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 uh, my my uh, inner um, answer to these impulses? And God is speaking to us through everything, through, through, through the books, uh, to the meeting of the people, uh, to the sign of the time, and uh, uh, we should um, have the uh, the time for 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 reflect. Maybe we need some a little bit of distance to go deeper and uh, to see the thing in the broader context. And I think this is uh, what we can uh, offer to, to, to this world of techniques. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Thomas. Uh, I write liturgical resources to link ecological insights with the gospel. That's sort of my reason for living most of the time. Uh, as a sociologist, as a pastor, you know, you're sort of saying we have a new adventure to go into. Um, do you see any hope for liturgical structure restructuring? Uh, is it a matter of burning the scaffolding? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure if I, if I catch the, the point. Uh, uh, what was the last... Uh, I'm not sure if I catch the point. Uh, Liturgy in yeah. the Catholic Church is a very structured yeah, yeah, yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so for the adventure for the future, you know, the next stage of the church's life, you know, uh, do you see anything from your experience, sociology, um, being a pastor, that liturgy needs to be reformed again, mm -hmm. a new reform. I think there must be uh, the very variety in liturgy. I'm so uh, happy 
uh, and so lucky that I um, I exercise so many types of, of, of liturgy. Uh, so during the uh, time of uh, persecution, I've I've got no no colleagues, and no no host, and I celebrated uh, with um, uh, two people and the um, usual table with the usual bread and and wine without any vestment and so and uh, uh, it was a great experience uh, and then uh, after the fall of communism I came to Rome and I concelebrated with the Pope and uh, also in the Basilica and his private is all this Roman and, and then uh, I came to America and uh, uh, and uh, I was uh, so used for this uh, Roman uh, type of liturgy and then uh, I was with one American uh, bishop and uh, when was the uh, greeting so oh Thomas hello Thomas uh, all the best to you and to Czechoslovakia so it was his kiss of <laughs> of peace né? and then I uh, came to, to, to India and um, I, I, I see this uh, Indian liturgy and after the liturgy, after the mass, they asked me to dance some Czechoslovak dance. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I said, oh, um, I, 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 it's, it's a little bit problem <laughs> because uh, from my youth I remember just tango and uh, it wouldn't be perhaps uh, the best and I don't know what uh, our archbishop would say to this. <laughs> and so I must, uh, I must say uh, that uh, in our country uh, we are not able to express the joy from the Eucharist Christ through dance. So I have exercised all this in and 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 the liturgy in Africa and with all this hallelujah and 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 so so I I see the liturgy must be very colorful and and creative and sometimes uh, I think also this COVID time was a very good experience when the church uh, churches were closed and for the believers it was the the the, the challenge to discover another way how to communicate with God. I think it was the uh, great God pedagogy for many, many Christians. Uh, for them, the only expression of their faith was to go on Sunday to, 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 to the Mass. Ne? And, and then uh, uh, our Lord said, okay, uh, girls and boys, I will close these churches and uh, uh, now you must uh, discover uh, a new attempt uh, how to uh, celebrate uh, um, uh, the face and so and for many people the time of uh, closed uh, I, I, I wrote also a, a, a book time of closed churches it was my sermons during this um, uh, during this uh, time uh, because I was uh, against this transmission of the mess through television because I think uh, the television and the media are for transmission of the information so the preaching is information but uh, but uh, the Eucharist through uh, uh, through television so uh, the meal uh, online is absurd ne? and I think to this uh, uh, to, to the real presence of Christ it belongs the real presence of believers and um, uh, s uh, for, 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 for many people for many Catholic families this time of the closed churches was the first opportunity to speak about uh, the faith in the family. So they were just going regularly to the mass and, uh, and then was no mass <laughs> and, uh, and, and there was the, uh, what we will do on Sunday, perhaps we will read uh, the gospel and speak about it and speak about our, uh, our troubles, uh, our doubts and so, and it was a great spiritual experience. So I think it was very, very good lesson of, uh, from God, this, this closed churches and uh, the challenge to, to be creative in our relations with God. Well, now, uh, I think Margaret Byrne and then Neil Ormerod. And then, oh, sorry, I thought, was there? Well, along that row, anyway. <laughs> 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 
and then we'll see how we go after those two. Uh, thank you. Good to have another woman. Thank you, Father. <laughs> uh, my name is Patrick Kirkwood. Um, some years ago, I did an interview with an American sister called Sandra Schneiders, who's a great scripture scholar, and we eventually spoke about the ordination of women. And she said to me, we must not make the mistake of ordaining them into the current clerical structure. Mm -hmm. And I've never forgotten that. And so what I've been thinking about is where is the back door or the thin edge of the wedge by which we might make this happen? Mm -hmm. And an example would be in a, in a big girls' school, they go away on a retreat. Mm -hmm. And the religious education teacher who is trained in theology, she goes away. But she said to me once, I've got to ring up and get a priest to come out and celebrate the Eucharist. Why can't I celebrate the Eucharist for my girls? And so that is the thin edge of the wedge, that we mm -hmm. must ordain women for mm -hmm. specific occasions and congregations and situations in life, and not only celebrate the Eucharist, but also to offer reconciliation. Mm. What, what would you think of that? Ask the, <laughs> ask the Pope. <laughs> 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 <coughs> so uh, I, 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 I think uh, um, uh, the slides uh, reminds me uh, the interrogation by the secret police. Yeah. So this this main argument against the ordination of women that Jesus. Uh, 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 have chosen uh, just uh, men. It's not. Uh, it does not work for me because Jesus. Um, uh, be, uh, Jesus had chosen just uh, just uh, just the Jews, right? and uh, how we can ordain uh, the Japanese and and and, and uh, Australian people? Right? Jesus. Uh, Jesus uh, had chosen the apostle just the Jews, and uh, uh, so I think the same logic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, but you are right that uh, uh, that the, uh, 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 that this uh, service uh, that this uh, um, uh, this role and the woman in the church it shouldn't be just to press them in this uh, in this. Uh, old clerical model. Ne? We must find uh, some new way, and perhaps it will be. I think there is something. There are some discussions uh, behind the scene about um, ordination, uh, because uh, there is a fear that uh, the woman ordination would be the schisma in the church, and so. But uh, I think they 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 uh, they are looking for some uh, new way. <coughs> Of the, uh, don't uh, don't uh, call this uh, priest. Uh, sh find another name, uh, but uh, offer the possibility to to to, to serve. So why not? Eh? Perhaps it is not just formal. It's uh, perhaps uh, we should create the the the, uh, the role of women, which is uh, which will be on the same level with the priest activity, uh, but uh, the role a uh, little bit the accommodate to the charisma of, of, of women, so not to push them in this um, men style of priest, but perhaps to do to, 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 to something, yeah. yeah. Neil Omer. But I'm afraid it, <laughs> it takes some time. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. Yes, thank you for this evening. Um, from the beginning of his papacy, from the beginning of his papacy, Pope Francis has put a great emphasis on the environment. And it seems to me that this environmental concern speaks to the secular age in a way that opens up opportunities for dialogue. How would you see the churches bringing that that issue, that insight that Pope Francis has had into dialogue with a secular world who is very concerned about environmental issues as well. I think it is a point uh, when the church is uh, now in a good uh, 
um, in, in um, uh, touch the point which is important for the young people. Um, because the, the ethical, ethical sensitivity of the young generation uh, that's quite deep, uh, but is uh, they are uh, the new uh, and different uh, forecasts uh, than uh, the old generation. So the young generation is n have not so problems with uh, sexuality and so on, but they feel the responsibility for the environment and also for the uh, for 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 the minorities and, and, and that is something uh, what is important for Pope Francis and this is the moment uh, when uh, the voice of the church uh, is corresponding with the sensitivity, moral sensitivity of the young generation and I think it's very good eh? and uh, we must be creative how to put it in life uh, this uh, responsibility for for our environment, because it is something what appeals uh, to, to especially the young generation. Now the last question is in the back row, I think. No? Sorry? No? Okay. No. Uh, good evening. My name is Donnie Velasco. I work in the Diocese of Parramatta in the space of adult faith formation and in the mission enhancement team. Uh, my the question was around um, your response to the nuns and your experience in setting up that spirituality center for them. Uh, and that I think it represents a kind of archetype of the experience of the young people that we work with. We take them to experiences like World Youth Day. Um, we have a, a locally grown initiative called the Faith Feed where we engage them in their doubts and questions. But often when they return to the parish, they see the equivalent of a, a staid um, uh, parish congregation, um, what you might describe as maybe a, a church that's still in its uh, in its morning period rather than its afternoon. So, what would you what would you say um, uh, is a if you were to set up another spirituality center for a parish? What would be on their curriculum for them to be better accompaniers of those people who are seekers? Um, mm. Because in our experience, the seekers are quite um, you know the, we have a good relationship with them, but when we connect them with the parish, sometimes they don't feel quite at home. So what would be the parish curriculum mm -hmm. to accompany those seekers? And a, a quick second question, can you demonstrate us a bit of your tango? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, but what is it? Last? Last? Your demonstrate your tango. <laughs> demonstrate it. Demonstrate your tango, the dance. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, I have very few uh, personal experience with the traditional parishes uh, because uh, I uh, uh, there was a very charismatic uh, priest in 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 Prague and uh, uh, it was uh, in the uh, center of the old uh, town of Prague and uh, he was some way tolerated by the regime nobody uh, nobody knows why uh, perhaps it was a little bit the window for the tourists. Uh, there is a one, one, one church, uh, there are also young people, and, and uh, he was uh, very, um, uh, uh, very open to the artist. And uh, uh, so it was a special intellectual, um, intellectual parish. And I created uh, parish in this sense. So, uh, uh, sometimes in the in the local parishes, there's a problem because um, there are so few priests, and um, then um, our church was trying to uh, to uh, to invite the priest from 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 abroad, especially from Poland, but uh, it was not so good solution because the mentality. Um, uh, the Polish mentality, the Czech mentality are very different. Uh, so, um, and some some of uh, the priests coming from abroad, uh, very good for our priests, uh, for our church, because they brought some new uh, new impulses, a new inspiration, and so. But uh, other were uh, men, uh, they have the mentality uh, uh, quite different.
red mentality and they didn't understand uh, the Czech mentality. Uh, I, I was once a lecture for the priest, uh, uh, for a priest from abroad, and said, you must start with uh, uh, reading the um, uh, Good Soldier Schweik and, uh, and, 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 and uh, see the Czech films and, uh, and uh, study the Czech literature because uh, uh, the uh, priest is not uh, just uh, the man who is providing the mass <laughs> and um, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, uh, evangelization must be the inculturation the evangelization without inculturation is just indoctrination and in our countries we are allergic to indoctrination so it must be the inculturation and you must first of all to understand the domestic culture and then you can bring something new to this culture but you must know it respect it it and know uh, there were some this missionaries also some this fundamentalist american uh, uh, american um, uh, evangeli uh, evangelical uh, missionaries uh, the bible in one hand and uh, and the beefsteak in <laughs> in the second hand and uh, hallelujah hallelujah uh, you are saved come come on Thursday and uh, very simply and <laughs> it was <laughs> quite uh, quite contraproductive for the Czech, uh, Czech uh, culture. They think they they are in some 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 part of Africa and so on. So. And uh, and we are after communism. So, so, so. And <coughs> um, so I think this inculturation is very very <laughs> very very important. And uh, yeah. Uh, the secularism is exculturation. Exculturation is always dangerous. Ne? We must um, not to uh, not to accept uncritically uh, the the the. the contemporary culture but also uh, to not to be afraid it, it must be the spirit of, 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 of spiritual uh, what is this just uh, with the spiritual uh, re, uh, um, uh, recognition uh, discernment the discernment. spiritual discernment so I think it is very important in uh, in the time of the persecutions we needed uh, the virtue of uh, uh, of strength and but now we need the virtue of wisdom uh, not just uh, the virtue of courage is always uh, uh, important uh, but after uh, the persecution we need more the virtue of, of wisdom and this spiritual discernment uh, not to be the culture warrior and not uh, to be uh, just uh, conform with our environment to, uh, to always have the critical um, sympathy and, um, and, and the inner dialogue respect and also the critical stance through this contemplative approach uh, to, to reality. Thomas, in uh, the afternoon of Christianity, the courage to change, you give us this wonderful image. While the traditional institutional forms of religion often resemble drying riverbeds, interest in spirituality of all kinds is a surging current undermining old banks and carving out new channels. Yeah. So we're very grateful to you for helping us to uh, undermine old banks and to carve <laughs> out new channels. <laughs> and without further ado, could I invite your Bishop Vincent Long to come forward and offer a vote of thanks. <laughs> I think it's been a very um, engaging and enthralling conversation between um, Father Frank Brennan and um, Monsignor Thomas Halleck that we've been privileged to be um, a, a part of, and also um, the many other 
who have been following us uh, online. So um, it pertains to me to um, give a vote of thanks to those who have made this evening uh, possible. Uh, first of all, the um, communications team led by uh, Anita here for the practical and the technical support. Also to uh, Brother Mark O'Connor, uh, who has been a, um, a, uh, a quiet achiever uh, in the diocese, <laughs> though his uh, marriage conference might not use the objective quiet to describe him, <laughs> uh, but uh, he's got a fantastic network um, and um, a knack for quality, and uh, that quality, uh, I think you would agree, has been on display um, this afternoon. <laughs> and um, I thank um, Frank for uh, coming all the way from the Sunshine State uh, to uh, <laughs> raise us with his presence and uh, also uh, those very pertinent probing uh, questions uh, to, um, uh, to the guest speaker. And uh, you, you ought to agree that it, he has conducted this conversation extremely thoughtfully and well. So thank you, Frank. <laughs> and, and Frank will do the same uh, in Melbourne, uh, the second edition of um, the Australian tour uh, by, um, by, by Thomas, and so we wish uh, um, that edition well as well. Uh, we thank um, Thomas um, for agreeing to venture down under and giving us such uh, a delightful and, and profound um, uh, um, thoughts on the topic of, um, of, of um, Christianity um, in the age of um, secularism uh, through that title, um, Help My Unbelief. And, and um, Thomas lived under communism like I did for a time. And um, then under the impact of um, secularization like we do in Australia, his insights into a renewed or reimagined Christianity could serve the church well into the future as we leave the shallow harbor of Christendom and its various manifestations. And, and <clears throat> during the, um, the pandemic, I read his book, um, and I particularly like uh, a, a, a passage which, um, uh, with your indulgence, I quote, um, I cannot help but wonder whether the time of empty and closed churches is not some kind of cautionary vision of what might happen in a not distant future. This is what it could look like, the church could look like in years to come. Some might see this as a sign of religious decay or even moral decadence, but others would suggest that we are at a threshold of an emerging Christianity. The, the afternoon Christianity, which is not confined to ornate cathedrals, churches, or even convents and monasteries. Um, and the, the idea of the, the new Galilee, Galilee being the, the emblem of Jesus' um, radical and inclusive and bound-breaking mission uh, to the Gentiles, to the unbelievers, um, uh, to the uh, to the seekers of, of truth everywhere. And I think that, that metaphor uh, is so fitting for us today. Um, uh, we encounter Christ um, beyond the known boundaries of our worldview, the safe moorings of the past. We meet him in the company of seekers of truth. Um, so thank you, Thomas, for your courage your deep faith steeped in mysticism and, and suffering, and above all, your prophetic message for the church today, including Australia. You are one of the most thoughtful, learned, and interesting Catholics. We in Australia, and especially here in Parramatta, are so honored to listen to you in person, to be inspired and challenged by you. So let's put our hands together. <laughs> oh. Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> Thank you, Vincent. <laughs> Wonderful. Yes. Oh, Anita. Yes. Thank you very much, Bishop, and thank you, um, Thomas and Father Frank. Um, that brings tonight's proceedings to a close. Please continue to stay connected with us. We love being uh, you being in our community. So please continue to follow us on social media or Catholic Outlook, and we'll keep you updated with our next events that Brother Mark, in his well connectedness, has. Um, has already arranged. Please feel free to stick around for a cup of tea or coffee, have a chat, have a chat with Father Frank or Monsignor Halleck for a short while. And thank you once again. See you. Good night, everyone. No. Thanks, Thomas. So. <laughs> oh, good. Thanks.